Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's special presentation of our Beyond Words program from the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Beverly Hills, California. In addition to the array of diverse programming that we present on our stages in music and dance, theater and film, the Wallace also has a robust commitment to arts learning. And when we say arts learning, our goal is to serve people of all ages and abilities with special focus on those who might often be left out or overlooked. In the last several years, we've had great support from our friends at the National Guild for Community Arts Education and a program called Lifetime Arts have encouraged us to look at programming for older adults, to think of ways that the walls can be a resource to this community and be a forum for people to foster their skills in the arts, their sense of confidence in their own creativity, and their ability to share their stories with others. These are important stories that everyone deserves to hear. And I want to give special thanks to my colleague Deborah Pascaret, who's led our efforts in serving older adults, um, has invested a great deal of her time and energy in learning about effective practices and then in her own creativity, designing programs that we're now proud to offer. So this Beyond Words program is second in a series of courses for older adults. And in our original visioning, the program would conclude in a presentation at our lovely studio theater at the Wallace. But because of COVID and the pandemic, we've moved our world online and are grateful that Zoom gives us a platform to share these important stories. And we welcome the friends and family and other guests who are here to support the participants in their important work. The point of the class was not to put on a show, it was to invest in these, in these people. But the culmination does put sort of icing on the cake and gives people a chance to share the great work that they've been doing. And finally, I would say that in addition to the growth of the participants and all of their learning, Maybe the real magic of the program is fostering community and letting people feel a real sense of connection during a time of such extreme isolation and loneliness. So we feel proud at the Wallace to be able to contribute a, a little bit to a sense of connection and community. So now let me turn it over to my terrific colleague and leader of this program Beyond Words, Deborah Pascaret. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am here live from the Wallace, one of the first times I've been here since March. It's only myself and our technical assistant here uh, for the day, and we are here to have this wonderful live stream for you coming from all of our participants' homes across California. So today is the first time that we are actually presenting for the newest class that we've had to offer called Beyond Words. And the difference in this class is it's sort of storytelling plus. So I wanted to create a course that the, the students could write their stories and access their personal histories, but also go beyond that and look to photography or collage or painting or anything that they could imagine that would help them tell their story. And so this is the first time we've ever done the class and it's, even a little more special because we're doing it on Zoom, which means we're doing visuals and readings at the same time. So hopefully it will all come out wonderfully and you'll be able to see everything that they've been working on. For the last 12 weeks, we've met every Thursday afternoon, I'm sorry, every Wednesday afternoon, and it's been absolutely amazing. And I can't wait for you to hear their wonderful words and see their wonderful work. And so now beyond words. Call me Panthera. I was born in the year of the tiger. The legacy of my ambush passes through me. Once ashamed, I now wear my stripes with pride. Like the true tigress, I am. Hi, I'm Cindy Trost. This next piece is called, I love trees, but I hate the woods. I rarely use the path through the woods as my route to or from Mark Twain Junior High. The truth is, 
I wasn't allowed to. But I was going to Pam's house after school and she said, let's cut through the woods. And so the next thing you know, I'm in the woods breaking my mother's commandment, thou shalt not walk through the woods, praying that I don't get caught and realizing I hate the woods. Even on the sunniest day, it's always a little darker in the woods. The wind plays tricks on your hearing. Snakes lurk beneath the fallen leaves at your feet and birds perched high above your head wait patiently for the right opportunity to swoop down and peck your eyes out. Well, just like in the Wizard of Oz, when I'm in the woods, there's a voice in my head that I hear it goes, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And what's more, the woods are the clandestine meeting place of the kids who drink alcohol and smoke pot, something I didn't do. Well, not yet anyway. But I was worried if discovered, they would kill me to keep me silent. My paranoid thoughts of danger were interrupted by a crack of a breaking stick behind me. Suddenly, Anita and Terry, two bullies from school, whacked Pam and I on the head and ran off. Thanks, girls. Now I can add the fear of running into bullies to my long list of reasons for why I hate the woods. The next piece I'd like to share with you is called My Four Cornerstones. Hope. The feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. My childhood was a dysfunctional mess punctuated with episodes of violence and moments of love and bliss. I spent hours daydreaming of a future life. Hope for that future life shaped who I am today. This I know for sure. Resourcefulness. The ability to find quick and clever ways to overcome difficulties. The more activities I became involved in at school, the less time I spent at home catching rides with friends and mining for coins from the deep crevices of our old couch to pay my way to the movies bought me even more time away. Resourcefulness taught me how to problem solve and shaped who I am today. This I know for sure. Resilience, the process of adapting well in the face of significant stress, adversity, threats, trauma, or tragedy. I believe if my life were a state, it would be Florida. Most days are filled with beautiful blue skies and sunshine until the hurricanes come ashore. But like a palm tree on the beach, I stand tall in a storm as rain beats down and thunder crashes around me. When the wind blows, I bend. And when it blows harder, I bend more, taking the full force, refusing to be broken. Resilience in dark and uncertain times shaped who I am today. This I know for sure. Commitment. The state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or activity. If you think you are beaten, you are. And if you think you dare not, you don't. If you think you'll lose, you've lost. For out in the world you'll find success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in a state of mind. I discovered this poem, it's called Thinking, by Walter D. Wintel when I was a teenager, and the words became my anthem, and they fire me up like a collegiate fight song. I have spent a lifetime of choosing to dare, choosing to compete, choosing to live. Commitment to creating a life of my choosing shaped who I am today. This I know for sure. Thank you. made in God's image. My wife tells me I'm the image of God in her life. I don't let it get to my head cause she's God's image in mine. Hi, I'm Avia Farkas and I'm going to read Deep Pain and Heavenly Solace. The issue of severe racial disparity in the United States seemed to be dormant for white people prior to the murder of George Floyd. We knew that the criminal in chief was racist as evidenced by his statements and inhuman immigration policies, but the fact of our white privilege hovered under our radar. Now it glares like a bright garish neon flashing sign interrupting our deep slumber. I was graced to grow up in a fully integrated neighborhood, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. 
My school photos evidence a beautiful bouquet, a full palette of human skin colors. I grew up with African American, Hispanic American, Chinese American, Jewish, and WASP kids. We played and ate and learned together. I was graced to be born to a mother who taught us to see, to look for the beauty in a human face, to find the uniqueness and beauty of all hair, eye, nose, and lip shapes, textures, and colors. We'd ride the subway and the long bench seating of the 1950s afforded an opportunity to spend long minutes looking across the aisle to see what is distinctive, handsome about this human being in front of us. I grew up in a family which in addition to tolerance also caused me tremendous fear. During the Holocaust, my mother had saved my father's life, yet they were always fighting physical, blood drawn, vile Hungarian curses, shouting, and fully equal to the fear from my family was the terrible pain I felt as a child watching crowds of white people spitting, yelling, throwing rocks, beating, using whips, batons, bullhorns, bombs, dogs, anything to keep girls and boys my age from going to school or church, or sitting, eating in a public space. The boys and girls happened to be black. They were deserving of education, deserving of everything this country has to offer, just like me, just like any American. But they happened to be a different color. And because of this, because of their skin, Others wanted to stop them from doing the things I wanted to do and took for granted. My white privilege, the things I could do freely without thought, without question. As I put together the photos for the flat lake, which you now see on screen as I read this piece, I came to understand that the deep pain I felt as a child watching the nightly violence on TV triggered me to my soul because of my own home was violent. I had watched my mother beat my father bloody, watched my mother hitting my sister with her high heel shoe. Watching German shepherd dogs attack people was unbelievably shocking. I knew that these dogs were used by Nazi soldiers to attack Jews during World War II. Oh my God, could this be happening in the United States? Viewing the violence on TV racked my little girl's soul, affected me to my core, bore deep into my heart because it reflected the violence in my home and the violence of the war. The flat lay artwork shows photos of the racist violence, an alto saxophone, the December 1960 receipt for my sax, and a piece of music, Heavenly Aida, which I played often. Playing my sax allowed me to obtain a profound peace and deep solace from the violence in my world. Playing music provided an escape for the torture in my soul. Today, the murders of people just because they are black also racks my soul. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Stefan Clark, Botham Jean, Philandro Castile, Alton Sterling, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown. The list of murders goes on and on and continues. The needless loss of life because of one skin color. This is horribly wrong and must end. I am again racked by the pain of a society which hates others, which has lost its soul. Isabel Wilkerson in her newest book, Cast, notes that when we purchase an old house, we inherit all that is wrong with the house and it's up to us to fix it. The United States has inherited a broken house, a broken system of inequality based on caste, on racism, skin color, 
and it is up to us to fix it. Begin with monetary reparations and a full and wholesome apology and acknowledgement of all the ways people of color have been wronged. Begin with acknowledgement of how wrong our judicial system is and has been to people who look different. Begin with knowing that we are all just human beings and our worth is inherent in our birth. Nothing more, nothing less. Thank you. Hi, I'm Camille Dayon. I'm a seasoned spicy senior who's lived a rich and colorful life, peppered with impressive people and places, but balanced by the potholes of strife. If I had to do it over, there's not too much that I would change, except my high-pitched voice that makes dogs run to get out of range. My next piece is called Authentic Eccentricity. I've been asked to look into the believing mirror this week and reflect on my authenticity or lack thereof. So in my moment of mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the most authentic of them all, I had the opportunity to take a good look back at myself and reflect on my image to see who I really am. There were times in my life where I didn't feel confident enough to be true to myself times where I felt I needed to distort my authenticity to fit in, get a job, make someone like me, not be judged, and other such situations. At the age I'm at now, though, and the fact that I'm a bona fide senior citizen, having attained <laughs> the status of seniority, I feel that I can finally live in my authentic, true self-skin and not worry at all what anybody thinks. Here I am as is. I can indulge my eccentricities. Hell, I can celebrate them now because I've earned it. It's one of the perks of being a senior citizen. For once in my life, I feel that I don't have to gain anybody's approval or permission as I did in my younger years. As a lifelong rebel, I've always tended to deviate from the curb, which is the definition of eccentricity. I can be proud of my quirks and imperfections and not embarrassed about them. Case in point, my OCD tendencies are now an asset given the pandemic that we're in. I already had the hand washing and keeping things spick and span routine down for years. So it amuses me now that this is the new recommended norm. And for once, I was ahead of the curve instead of deviating from it. What has always consistently brought me back to my most authentic self, though, is being on the beach. Something about the ocean and nature, but mostly the ocean, has always made me feel I was at peace with the real Camille, connected and calm. Not the chanel up poser who dressed to impress for so many years. Uncomfortable four-inch heels, uncomfortable in conforming. At the beach, on the sand, it's just me, the happiest me. Breezes blowing worries right out of my head. Bare feet and a bare soul, open, uncontained, conforming to nothing. Not afraid of anything and free from the constrictions of society and other people's views and expectations. It's a relief after so many decades of trying to fit into Cinderella's glass slipper that I can now just romp around in my flip-flops and be totally good with it. My next piece is called Camille's Legacy. My legacy won't be my jewels that fill more than one safe deposit box. Most have long since been sold to stay afloat from some of life's hard knocks. My legacy will be an imprint, an impression of who I strove to be. My legacy will be my writings that reveal the all, the all the authentic facets of who I was meant to be. Thank you. <gasps> I am a budding filmmaker in my youth. Will I be the next Tuffaut or Godard? Hi, I'm Patricia Cahill, and this is my work, Sacred Heart, Andre and Me. 
I would take the 1224 bus around the Hancock Park Tennis Club in front of our house to my high school on Arden Drive. I was having a hard time breathing because I'm allergic to It was an all girls Catholic school called Convent of the Sacred Heart. My best friend was Andre Dubré, who like me was a hybrid, living in both Montreal and Los Angeles because of the divorce of both of our parents. We were very close and she would protect me against the mean-spirited Upper West Mount boss gangs of the school, Don Marion and Geraldine Pirtle, who were always picking on me for one thing or another. Without Andre and her bubbly, warm, kind-spirited manner, I would have been a total outcast. We had to go to mass and confession on a daily basis, and I didn't know why, as I wondered what sins does an 11-year-old child have? The only people I thought should go to mass and confession every day were Dawn Marion, Geraldine Pirtle, and the rest of their gang. My favorite teacher was Senora Amasuno, my history teacher. He was a lay teacher, not a nun. Her husband was Spanish, and they had lived for many years in Santander, where he came from. She had previously taught in Spain before coming to Sacred Heart. I worshiped Senora Amasuno because she was exotic, and beautiful, and she seemed so otherworldly to me. She was like nothing I had ever experienced in my community, in either LA or Montreal up until this point. When she was teaching, I would write down all of her notes for beta. I would later memorize all her notes so that when exam time came around, I would simply regurgitate them, and I would always get an A+. It was my goal to please her in anywhere that I could, and she was a healthy distraction for me from the school, the nuns, and the mean girls. Andrea and I also joined the women's basketball team at the Sacred Heart Gym, which was right next to the school. Our goals were to try and get scholarships to a good college where we could each manifest our talents. Andrea was an artist and I was a budding filmmaker. So we stuck to the strict guidelines of Sacred Heart to get out of there as soon as we possibly could. I made a few short 16 millimeter films in the Percy Walters dog park near my house. And Andre was always my lead actress, even though she wasn't an actress. I needed these short films to submit to Loyola University. Andre later moved back to Montreal to be with her mother, but we always stayed in touch as our friendship was sacred. She got into the prestigious Ecole de Beaux-Arts School of Fine Arts in Montreal and we would see each other every six months when we were visiting our mothers in Montreal or our fathers in LA. Thank you. A closet full of different masks, one for every role. I'm really just a five-year-old running away from home. I'm Constance Walker, and I'm reading I'm Outta Here. Today, I will be free. I am so happy. Mother wants us out of the house. My brother and I are an annoyance. I am five years old, and my brother has just turned eight. He didn't have a birthday party or even a cake, but today we have movie money and popcorn money, too. We are living in a dingy little row house in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, because our mother is caring for her own mother who is dying of cancer. I put on my thin pink coat that I got for Easter and headed for the door. It is December and cold today, but I will put my hands in my brother's pocket until he gives up and gives me his wool mittens. I feel so happy to be walking down the sidewalk with my brother Bob, heading towards the movie theater. It is about six blocks, but he knows the way. We won't have to listen to my mom and her mother insulting and ridiculing our unfortunate step-granddad or verbally shredding my much-loved paternal grandmother. No one is safe from their carnage. Later in my life, I will remember them as two witches from Macbeth hovering over a steaming cauldron. 
When we arrived at the theater, my brother had to give up our popcorn money to purchase the newest innovation in cinema, 3D cardboard glasses. Actually, more like cardboard goggles. This was unexpected, but promised the excitement of a cinematic breakthrough. It was a Marilyn Monroe film, which might have been gentlemen prefer blondes. I only remember confetti being tossed on screen, which through the 3D glasses appeared to be coming directly at us. Wow, I was impressed. It was over too soon. And as we exited the theater, I could feel the snow slowly beginning to drip down from the sky. As we walked towards home, the snowflakes became a heavier downflow until it was a haze of white. Neither Bob nor I were dressed for this snowstorm. Soon Bob could not see the street signs and could not remember which street would lead us back to grandma's. I looked around and I didn't know either. So I made a choice. I chose the street with the biggest and nicest houses. I insisted, it's that way. We had walked several blocks when we came to a park. My brother stopped. He knew we were lost, but would not admit it. He just refused to move. Surrounding the park were lovely houses decorated with cheerful Christmas lights. I made another decision. I will find a new home and new lights and huge candy canes. I carefully scanned the neighborhood and selected the best decorated house with lights and huge candy canes. It looked like Mr. and Mrs. Claus might live there. My brother refused to go with me, so I walked across the street to the house, went to the door, reached up and rang the doorbell. A nice grandmotherly lady answered the door. I rolled my eyes up at her and said, in my best pathetic voice, oh, I'm lost. Oh, you poor child, she replied. Are you alone? I pointed across the street to my brother. She took me inside and spoke quietly to her husband, a nice grandfatherly man. And while I was being served Christmas cookies and cocoa, her husband went across the street and convinced my brother to join me. Unfortunately, Bob knew our step-grandfather's name and his number was in the phone book. Soon Harry, the step-granddad, was at the house. Oh, my escape plan was sunk. If only my brother had had the imagination to tell the kindly couple, we're orphans. Thank you. Well, 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 this is me hiding behind the lens, just seeing what I want to see. Uh, but I've come out behind from the camera and seen the world as it is today. As my grandmother would say, oi veyesmir. Well, my name is Ira and I'm talking about East Coast auto painters. In 1946, my father opens East Coast auto painters on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. It was the first production auto paint shop in New York State advertising two coats of enamel paint baked in an oven and uh, three coats for $65. It really didn't matter what you paid, you just got enough color to cover the primer. After school, I worked at the paint shop cleaning up the painted cars. One day, a good looking young man with an even better looking wife pulled into the paint shop and convinced my father to paint his car on the come. He had a screen test in Hollywood and didn't want to show up at the studio with a beat up, beat up Chevy. And he promised to send the money after making it big in Hollywood. A few years later, 
my father did get an $85 check in the mail from Steve McQueen. He framed the check and kept it on his desk. Another time, a man in a double-breasted suit came in and convinced my father to let him hang around, learn the auto paint business. Earl Scheib hung around, learned the business, and opened his first auto paint shop in a tent in Brooklyn. Years later, when I made a sales call on Earl Scheib at his Wilshire Boulevard office, he remembered my father's kindness and he bought me lunch. My most vivid memory of working at the auto paint shop is when it was located on the fourth floor of the Echo Park garage on the Grand Concourse. The Vegas radio TV store was located on the first floor and there was always a crowd looking in his window watching the test pattern on the Dumont TV. And part of my job was to drive the newly painted cars down the fourth floors of steep curving ramps to the Grand Concourse where the customers waited for their cars. I was doing just that with a newly painted 1947 Studebaker when the brakes failed. Foolishly, I was coasting in neutral. The emergency brake didn't slow the car and I almost stripped the gears trying to shift into first gear. It was real panic time. With two curves to go, I scraped the right side of the car against the wall to slow up, trying, leaving a smear of green paint against the wall. The rabid Studebaker emerged from the garage's exit and while the astonished owner watched, I crossed the northbound lane of the Grand Concourse and came to a stop on the road's median. Luckily, no cars were coming at the time to complete the disaster. The owner's complaint was quickly countered by my father's threat to sue him because his son could have been killed because of the brake failure. Well, as you'd imagine, it was some time before I ventured down that driveway again. Many years later, during a nostalgic visit to the Bronx, I noticed that the green smear was still there but it had faded in spite of the paint shop's guarantee against the paint fading. East Coast Auto Painters was later located on Jerome Avenue under the IRT subway, and the deafening rumbling from the trains passing overhead stopped all talking in mid-sentence. Jerome Avenue was lined with used car dealers, and every day a tall, gaunt man in overalls wearing suspenders dragging a box on wheels would walk up the street, stopping at all the dealers. He was known only as Mr. Speedometer, and he never spoke. The car dealers paid him to set back the speedometers on their used cars. If anybody tried to watch how he did it, he would stop, he would pack up his box and leave mid-job. It was rumored that he made $500 a week cash every week. One day, I got the bright idea to set up a movie screen in front of a line of cars waiting to be painted, and I'd project the movie from the top of a car in the back. Everybody invited a date and sat in the cars, watched the films, eating popcorn, and trying to make out in our indoor drive-in movie. For many years, it became a cheap Saturday night date ritual. Thank you. Daughter, student, spouse, healer, friend, mother. I wait to see what I will yet become. Hello, I'm Linda Lundine, and this is Comet. A smudge of light in the night sky. Sunlight reflects from rock and ice. It was here before 6,000 years. Sandstone sweeping above little homes of rock. On the wall, handprints of a child long gone. On the floor, a corn cob chewed 500 years ago. We will pass. The comet will be back. And on a different note, this is my second piece, Squalor Motel. There are places that just feel like home from the beginning. Berkeley was such a place for me. We moved from Alameda to Berkeley when I started my second year of family medicine residency. The move was only a few miles, so we carried everything ourselves, load after load in our little truck. We must have made 20 trips. 
Every time we exited the freeway, we were greeted by the marquee of a nearby porno theater showing Squalor Motel. So our adorable, poorly built little house acquired that name, Squalor Motel. It looked like a house for a gnome or hobbit, all redwood paneling inside and out and ceiling so low I could almost touch them. The floor was covered with dull brown tile, which the real estate agent chirped was genuine battleship linoleum. There was endless work to be done on the house. All our friends who knew real estate or construction confirmed that the house was a real dump, but it was inexpensive and in a great neighborhood on a rarely used dead end street. There was a pocket park across the street where our daughter born two years later played regularly. Our next door neighbor was a gorilla gardener who sneaked California native plants into the landscaping of the hospital across the street. Some were removed by the real hospital gardeners, but mo mostly they thrived. By the time we moved away, the unsanctioned redwoods planted in our parking strip were 20 feet tall. When our daughter Elena arrived two years after we moved there, I continued to work and Bill, with the optimism of someone who has never had a child, planned to provide childcare as he worked on remodeling the house. As any experienced parent would expect, the remodeling proceeded very slowly. One day I arrived home and he was pulling up the floor tiles. They came up easily, revealing pine floorboards until we got about three feet in from the walls. Then it suddenly became impossible to remove them. It seems the floor had only been varnished around the edges, then covered with a big rug. Nothing would take that linoleum off the raw pine, and the tarry glue remained on the floor for months, sticking to feet and clothing. The remodeling was eventually finished, but not until shortly before we moved. But we were happy to be a real family, two adults, a St. Bernard mix, and a toddler who chased the dog around in her walker. Elena grew from babyhood to childhood and then headed off to kindergarten in a class taught by one of our neighbors. The dog grew to old age. He sometimes escaped out the front gate, then would, could walk no further. Helpful neighbors would drag him back into the yard. The Berkeley sensibility was either live and let live or total bossiness. If you were distracted, stopped at a green traffic light, no one would honk at you through the entire light change. But woe to you if you brought an item with gluten to a potluck. We lived in that hobbit house until Elena was six years old. Work and a wish to be closer to family led us to Southern California, to the place now known as Squalor Ranchette. As I was packing to move, I worked in the house while she and a friend played in the park about 30 feet away. The door was open and I could hear their voices from inside the house. I had no fear that they were in any danger, but a concerned busybody came by to tell me there were two unsupervised children playing across the street. That was Berkeley. Thank you. I'm 65, five nine with a six foot wingspan. I play basketball with teenagers trying to keep the mamba mentality going. Hi, I'm Alan. And this story is called The Dad Man. I know my father loved me. He loved my sister too. I'm glad he had a daughter. That was some love to observe. The two of them together really warm and special. It started with reading the funny pages in bed on Sunday mornings. I took part in that for a while, and then I pulled away from it. I'm not sure why. Maybe I lost interest in following the funnies. Maybe I wanted to get dressed instead of staying in my pajamas on Sunday mornings. Maybe some things aren't meant to be looked into too deeply. I don't know if my father knew how to love me in all the best ways to benefit me and benefit our relationship. I think he lacked the big brother aspect of being a father. 
it's not like he wasn't my friend. He was. But it turned out he became an ineffectual Jim Backus to James Dean's overbearing mother in Rebel Without a Cause. I remember having this fantasy as a kid. I was 10 years old. I thought it would be cool if my parents got divorced and my father married another lady he's happier with. <laughs> Why would I be having such thoughts if there wasn't something souring my gut about our family unit? My sister and I would listen to my parents yelling at each other downstairs on countless nights as we grew up. Their lines of dialogue were about the items my mother hoarded in the basement. But the tone, the pain, the anguish they exuded onto each other as they stood in front of stacks of junk piled high in what we called the back room seemed to be saying something else. It gave off a depressing vibe. Was the goal of the hoarding, was the goal of the ritual to find a solution to the hoarding? or to stay trapped inside a spiral like the roundup ride at a carnival that malfunctions and will not stop. Thank you. I was born a child of nature. I live among the green grasses and fallen golden leaves. I collect prickly pine cones from the forest floor. I rescue smooth river rocks from the raging rapids. These are the gems of my childhood, nature's gifts to me. Hi, my name is Becky, and the piece I'm going to read is called Autumn in Waymo. I arrived in the small alpine village of Waymo Switzerland to discover that Autumn also had just arrived. I was 23. Autumn is the season which unfailingly ushers in winter, but in the autumn of 1976, it did so reluctantly, begrudgingly, and with a hint of sorrow. Signs of summer and even spring had infiltrated Autumn that year giving it a certain vibrancy and vividness not usually found so late into the season. Autumn had a good thing going for it that year and had no desire to give it up just for the benefit of a season called winter. Winter, that season which would turn the village white and wash all of its colors away. <clears throat> The wildflowers of Switzerland bloom relatively late, often not first opening until mid-July. When they do bloom, they speak a language all their own, proclaiming beauty in all imaginable colors, pink to purple, red to orange, pale to dark blue, and all shades of yellow, cream, and white. These flowers are exhibitionists. They love to hang out and be seen especially in their prime. For blooming is what they do best. They do it fervently and with great passion, and they hate to give it up. When I arrived, many varieties of these wildflowers were still in bloom. That was very fortunate for me since I had not come until autumn. Although I had come to Waymo to study, I had also come to make take as many photographs of the blooming wildflowers as possible. More than that, I had come to be with these flowers, to commune with nature. These quiet flowers made great companions while traipsing across the Swiss countryside, especially on Fridays, our coveted day off. Be they growing aside grass-lined dirt pathways to a neighboring chalet or on steep rocky hillsides. 
in lush meadows that went on forever or in cow pastures, which rolled gently up and down the hillsides. I had my favorites to be sure, and so did my companions, the grazing cows. Eating a particular combination of wildflowers gave their cheese a distinctive flavor, which became known and relished in the region. My eye for beauty was not partial to the wildflowers alone that autumn. That would have been a travesty. I was also taken by the lush vegetation, the ubiquitous towering evergreens, the scatterings of varied deciduous trees, the village gardens ripe with white and red Swiss chards and other vegetables. <clears throat> and the cultivated fruit and nut trees grown in the gardens of each chalet, especially the apple trees. Their thick, dark branches hung low, heavily laden with fruit, and blossoms of pink and white still clung to them. On Fridays, I would hitchhike down the mountainside to the train station in Egla, where I would wait to board the slowest train which ran right alongside the northern shore of Lake Geneva to the city. As a few of us students who set out to hitchhike, we were usually picked up in the village center by one of several very large, very fast Mercedes Benz. On my first such trip, as we sped downhill, just before the first curve in the road, I spotted a blur of bright orange out of the window. It appeared to be a great oak tree, but it was hard to get a good look at, at that speed. I wasted no time discovering a footpath to the tree from my chalet and developed a great affinity for it, whose leaves of golden orange had conspired to hang on throughout all of autumn until well after the first few snowstorms of winter. I photographed the tree at frequent intervals, very saddened that winter to one day find the tree completely bare. I would not be in Waymo to see it budding in the spring, turning green in the summer, or a golden orange in the autumn, completing another cycle. I would have to be satisfied with my photographs, which, however beautiful, always fell short of the experience of being with the tree itself. In my sadness, I wondered if I might, one autumn, return to Waymo to visit this tree again in its prime. Thank you. The day I will fly is the day the earth lifts up its mantle like sheep drying in the summer sun where mountains blaze with lavender light. My giraffe bends down, I hold onto her neck, and she catapults me into the bright blue sky. Hi, my name's Kim, and this piece is called Altamont. On the eve of my 25th birthday, April 1980, my first year in architecture graduate school, I bought a two-story brick house in Charlottesville, Virginia for $55,000. $10,000 down. The house had been built around 1890 and subsequently been made into a duplex, now definitely in need of TLC. I hired my good friend and classmate, Lisa, to assist me for $5 an hour and a good deal on rent. I would live in the upstairs apartment, Lisa would live downstairs, and we planned the renovation to be completed by the time school started in the fall. I traded my VW Rabbit for my father's old Buick station wagon for the summer and borrowed his Reader's Digest Family Handyman Whole House Repair Guide. Uh, Lisa got us a couple of nail belts and after much thoughtful and conceptual design discussion on the house as an embodiment of the poetics of space, the ideas of Palladio and the aspirations of early Le Corbusier we started demolition, ripping out sagging plaster, damaged moldings, creaky cabinets, broken railings, and built anew. Dust reigned. 20th century nails, no match for 19th century wood. Petrified, aghast at coupling, 
yearning for a return to the forest or the forge. Winged mo moment of symmetry, homage to Mr. Jefferson, widow's walk, widow's peak, widow peaks at hazy blue ridge mountains, lilac scented. Dove la matita? Ecco la matita. Na Naples yellow, Tuscan red, light flesh, left-handed lady carpenters, hammers, joint knives, paintbrushes, etching a translucent field. Stare within a cabinet, opening to a wispy sky. Shiny galvanized nails look like worms, unable to penetrate. Skylight framed, installed, flashed. Clouds of puffy pillows out, dust within. Ivory lace tablecloth curtains swish gently, quietly. Hulking neighbor in a ripped white tee babbles and hums, slippery but joyous, painting the morning. Arching eyebrow window faces the dawn. Ephemeral laser sunbeams flood the house. Alice through the looking glass, clock smiling on the flip side. Don't think about the pebbles under the soles of your feet. Let your soul transcend that diaphragm of dirt and emerge from a tempestuous sea. Hall pass in perpetuity. Gray blank slate silences subterfuge anticipates chalk to incise the first mark. Aubergine, atmosphere, alabaster, dig a well, found a city, point, line, grid. Warm glowing lights, red ballet flats, tango dips, blondies parallel lines on the stereo, sylph-like parade in pretty baby lingerie. lingerie. A sparkle in the air, fizzier than the pink party punch. How many times did the night smile? Grasses sway in the breeze. Red Mercedes E-Class Coupe, circa 1970, parked atop lush green weeds, raw and cooked, world within a world of other places. Silky floral flocks hang against daydream green walls, dressing room as interior garden. Galactica blue walls envelop a white clawfoot club tub. First time homeowner neglects to shut off the outside faucet before a freezing spell. Ancient radiators explode black sludge covering every surface with an inky wash. Preparing the site or excavating the ruin, additive or subtractive, light or shadow. If I put the mirror in front of me, I can see my face with your back. Thank you. This is who I am now as I offer up a part of myself being, but not becoming. I emerge fearlessly. Hi, my name is Lucy Papilla. And the first piece I wanna share with you today is called The Apple Tree on South Randolph. Why would she do that? What on earth could I have done to deserve that? If I had pleased her more, would she love me enough not to hurt me? I remember the cold stone look on her face in that moment, the matter of factness. I was only eight and she was my mother. I want you to go outside and break off a switch from that apple tree. The fear I felt was more damaging than the red marks that would appear on my legs. Should, should I tell her I couldn't find one? Or should I choose a tiny switch? Or, or maybe I should choose a hefty twig or a branch? That'll just make her angrier than she already is. I knew the kind she wanted. A thin, limber switch, 
not a twig or a branch, but one that would catch the wind and bend swiftly as it lashed like a whip. In certain times, we can laugh at ourselves for doing those incredible back bends to avoid being punished. However, sometimes those memories singe our self-worth and feel as if we are scraping scabs off of our emotional selves. My second piece is called Out of the Blue. November 22nd, 2015, 4.54 p.m., sent a message to my brother on Facebook Messenger. Will, are you still in Montclair? I'm still in the high desert. It's been many years, but I would like to see you again. Would you be interested in getting together sometime? I wait. And I wait. And I wait. Finally, I receive a word back from my brother. Sorry, sis, for the late reply. I rarely go onto Facebook, and this is the first time I figured out how to use this messenger thing. I tried calling you, but you had changed your number, and I didn't have your post office box to send you a note. That was sent on August 7th, 2020, 10, 17 p.m., almost four years and nine months later. Did someone hack my brother's account? I mean, are you kidding me? Sorry, sis. I mean, I don't even remember him calling me sis ever. For the late reply? Oh, I'm so dumbfounded and confused. He messages me right out of the blue and acts like it hasn't been 23 years since we've spoken to each other. I, I create a little small talk to try and get some clue as to whether this is really my brother or not. He speaks of things that appear to be him, but I'm still not certain. He said he retired, but it hasn't been as great as he had hoped. Says he just can't seem to figure out who he is now that he's not an RN anymore, <laughs> that he was just some old guy. Funny, but I thought the same thing about myself. Oh, not an old guy, of course, but you get the idea. Maybe that's just typical of newly retired people trying to reinvent themselves. I shared with him that I'd gotten back into acting and music and started writing and painting. He's been trying to get back into music and even bought a piano. He feels that the only thing he's done successfully is to lose weight, about 95 pounds. Our conversation continued for about two hours. I don't remember having any conversation with my brother lasting that long. He talked of his daughter, who he's putting through nursing school, and his grandson, Finn. He asked, how's the family? Zoe and Nick sure got big. They probably don't even remember me. They sure got big? What are you talking about? It's been 23 years since he's seen them. They're 29 and 32. I, I sit in disbelief as he says, well, it's been good talking to you. We should get together soon. All the while I'm still thinking, is this my brother? He gives me a cell and home number and adds, I'd love to see you again. You would? Hey, wait, wait a minute. I, <laughs> my brother would like to see me again? So I gave him my number and told him I'd love to see him again as well. Okay, as soon as things open up, it would be nice to see each other. Love you, sis. Good night. Good night, my brother. If you are indeed my brother. Still unsure whether this was my brother or not, the next day I sent him a text message. Hey, Will, I just wanted to tell you how great it was to talk with you last night. I have really missed you. That was Saturday, August 8th at 1233 PM. I wait and I wait and I wait. Thank you.